we're live and welcome everybody for another episode of Dr. Jill Live. I am super excited about our topic. As you know, I love gut health and everything to do with the microbiome. And we're going to dive deep today on fecal microbiota transplant and why it might be for more than just C. diff, which is the current indication. What else might this be for? Where's the research? Where's the status? And I've got an expert here today. Um, Shana is a neuroscientist with an interest in alternative medicine that utilizes the body's innate systems. Love that. <laughs> she received her doctoral degree in neuroscience from University of British Columbia. Her research studies have focused on brain development and the impact of biological sex, exercise, and aging on the brain. She has a passion for medical education and scientific communication that is accessible, accurate, and digestible. Shana is the Director of Medical Communications and Affairs at Novel Biome and is focused on spreading educational and scientific information about the microbiome and FMT. Shana, so glad to have you here today. Thank you so much for having me. You're welcome. So I always like to start with story and especially like, how did you get into this field? You're obviously neuroscientist, microbiome. Now you and I know they're totally connected, but tell us like, how did you get into just your study in neuroscience? And then how did you get into the, uh, the microbiome research? Yeah. So um, I always found a way somehow uh, in my academic research to kind of find weird niches that like connected my interest in brain development and brain aging with like areas that we didn't seem to always put together. Um, so my master's work looked at ghrelin, which is a feeding hormone and how that actually changes as we age and how that might be tied to some of the dysfunctions in the brain and memory. Um, and so after leaving, doing my PhD, I went into the world of medical affairs. Um, and mostly my interest came there from wanting to be able to translate my kind of passion for science and education to actually how we can utilize that and allow people every day to kind of be able to consume these large amounts of information. And that's kind of what um, my focus has been on where I don't expect everybody to be able to read the hundred papers, but that's my job. And then how do we get that down to something that someone can understand and use that information? Um, and that kind of led me to fecal microbiota transplantation because it's an area where there's a lot of research, but that research hasn't really been connecting together as seamlessly as I think it could be. Um, and it's an area where I think we're going to see a lot more interest um, as well as a lot more use for it. And I felt like that was the right place to kind of settle myself in um, to kind of figure out how can we educate people on it? And in terms of that, how do we increase the research so that, you know, it can be utilized more widely? brilliantly said, and I love it because I remember 20 years ago in the beginning of one of my functional medicine practice, I'd have a college kid come in with depression or anxiety and I'd be like, okay, we need to do a stool profile. <laughs> and as you know, back 20 years ago, the data was what we've seen, I'm sure you could speak to this far more clearly than me, but the exponential increase, if you start to search microbiome, it is exponentially exploding and showing, you know, what I've been doing for 20 years and anyone in functional medicine has known about the microbiome and the brain and aging and memory. And so I'm sure, you know, again, even more than I do about how much is really coming out. And the great thing, I love this foundation because you're a researcher and I'm a scientist at heart. And what's true about our topic today is there is so much science and it's literally exploding. Do you want to comment on like what you've seen in your career as far as how much it's really increasing in the amount of data that's coming out on microbiome and medications and all these things? Yeah, I think the way that I always highlight it for people is the first understanding is that clinical trials are really expensive. They're not easy to run and a lot of them fail. The growth in clinical research in the application of fecal microbiota transplants outside of C. diff in the last 10 years has went from about 30 trials 10 years ago to about 300 trials in 2020. So that's a huge um, kind of explosion of resources to understanding how this works. But to get to doing a clinical trial, the amount of work that goes in both preclinically and early clinical studies are exponential. Um, so this research is growing kind of every day um, and in a really interesting way that we don't see a lot in research anymore where we're learning about the basics at the same time we're learning how it applies to disease. Yeah. Um, and so I find my day can be like reading a study about how FMT could be used for something like multiple sclerosis at the same time as we're learning about like the basics of like, oh, we should always pre-treat the gut before we do FMT. So it's very interesting that these two kind of facets are happening at the same time. And it's both a blessing and a curse um, yeah. because I think we're learning how it works and then we're going to have to augment how we apply it as we're doing it. But um, I think 
the ability to tie, tie into what our body can actually do already, I think will kind of highlight, you know, maybe not cure everything, but I think it could really help get us, move us forward in diseases where we're kind of at a stagnant pace. Love that. And I couldn't agree more. It's interesting because in my realm, of course, I'm medically trained as an MD, but then I do this functional integrative realm where a lot of the things, if we take the research and the way things go in classical medicine, it's there's research, there's maybe an idea, and then, you know, a, a couple of clinical, um, you know, senior, um, case studies. And then of course the research and it gets bigger in the randomized controlled trials, but usually that can take 20, 30 years till some idea or some say vitamin has some efficacy till it shows enough with the large trials to put it into clinical practice, right? You and I know this. And what you're describing is the pace of some of these things that are so helpful with less potential side effects, like a new drug, there might be some toxicity and stuff. And I feel like those sometimes carry more potential risk and less benefit, or the benefit is just with the risk, you have to be more careful of implementing it. All this to say, what I've done for 20 years is take stuff that's on the cutting edge coming out, maybe doesn't yet have clinical application, but I know like, okay, dosing vitamin C at 2000 a day, pretty darn safe. There's not a lot of people except for G6PD you know, issues um, that could have problems with that. And so I'd say, okay, if there's safety and there's potential efficacy, I will often start to implement before that 30 year curve because my patients don't have time to wait. And I think that's what you're describing here is we're doing, we're in the trenches, we're doing the stuff cutting edge, which means we have to take what we get and try to apply it in real time and not wait for those 30 years um, because we don't want our patients to wait. Does that make sense or does that feel? Yeah, and I mean, uh, at Novel Biom, we're focused in in autism spectrum disorder, um, which is really like right right at the beginning. Yeah. When I when I talk about it, I'm like, you know, the groundbreaking trials were you know 2017, 2019. Mm-hmm. Like this is recent, yes. um, but there's no other options. Yes, um, and I think we've had an understanding for a very long time how the gut ties into a lot of diseases but we haven't really put together the importance of, okay, so if the gut is dysfunctional, what happens if we reset it? Yes. Yes. Um, and I think that's where we're getting is this idea that, you know, um, you know, FMT at, at the kind of the more extreme end. Um, but it's, it's a hard reset on your gut. Yeah. And we're just now really getting to understand, you know, things that are bad for our overall health, also bad for our gut. Yes. Yes. Um, yes. And so how kind of resetting some of our things that are happening in our life can make changes in our gut, but in some cases a full reset's yeah. necessary. But then when we make those changes, the cascade that happens after that. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, from your perspective in, in functional medicine, you know, you have an understanding that like the whole body is connected. Yeah. Um, and I think one of the issues in traditional medicine and, and especially, you know, 20, 15, 20 years ago, it was like the brain does this, yeah. the stomach does this, the heart does this silos. But yeah. Mm-hmm. But we're in a place now we're like, oh, wait, everything is connected. Yeah. So change yeah. one thing, you change many things. Yeah. Um, and I think that's where gut health, I think is getting more appreciation because when we look at the gut, it's not only communicating, you know, in the basics of breaking down our food, but it's creating neurotransmitters, which are what communicate for the brain, but it's also, you know, dictating the immune system. Yes. And so these far reaching systems are being impacted by the gut. And I mean, now that we know it, it kind of makes sense. You're like, Oh, it processes all of our food, you know, breaks down all the molecules. It it's very interconnected, but it really does. It's talking everywhere. So, okay. So what does that happen when it does it right? When the gut is functioning properly, what else happens? And that's where we're starting to fully understand and to see how far and the number of disorders that are being researched, you know, ranging from gastrointestinal diseases, like, you know, inflammatory bowel disease or irritable bowel syndrome, but things like Parkinson's disease, autism spectrum disorder, uh, multiple sclerosis, uh, treatments outside of Mm -hmm. cancer. So like to mitigate some of the negative effects of cancer treatments are all being targeted for possible, you know, diseases where, you know, FMT and in gut restoration could play role. That makes so much sense. I just finished um, the uh, t- uh, chapter in an integrative cardiology textbook. It's a second edition. And the chapter I wrote was on gut and heart, right? And the connection of the microbiome. So and people would think like, what does that have to do with it? So pretty much any system you could talk about, there's a relation, it all talks. So let's go a little backwards. You and I know what FMT is, but maybe those listening are like, okay, what is this? I've kind of maybe heard about it. Let's go to the very basics. What is FMT? What does that mean? What does it encompass? I know there's several ways to do it. Let's start yeah. with definition and then we can talk about application. 
Yeah. So fecal microbiota transplantation or FNT is the idea of taking a healthy person's gut microbiome from their stool. And so these people are highly screened. Uh, it's very selective for people who could even act as a donor. I could not be a donor. Um, I am not healthy enough. Um, and I'm generally healthy. Um, so we take these well-screened donors and so their stool is broken down. So it's just basically the parts of the gut microbiome, the bacteria, the fungi, the, you know, the, the different viruses that are in there that make up this colony are purified. And then someone who has gut dysbiosis, and we're talking about a gut that's dysfunctional that cannot easily be changed. So something like probiotics or a change in diet is not going to reset their gut. They are going to take FMT, um, which is from this donor material. And so that ranges from colonoscopy um, and retention enemas to these new uh, new ways of doing things like um, F oral FMT capsules. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and then, then we, what we're seeing is you're re-educating the gut microbiome, teaching it how to be um, the best version of itself. Um, and so it recolonizes the gut. The gut starts to look more like the donor gut microbiome. So you get a healthy gut and then you, you see these huge secondary changes, not just in, in GI symptoms, but across the board, um, in for us with autism spectrum disorder, secondary changes, but as well in another other disorders, we see changes that aren't just gut related. Yeah, that makes so much sense because again, it goes all over the neurotransmitters and all this. So practically speaking, say someone visited your clinic, what would that look like? Would it be an intake? Would it be then a visit? Would it be follow up? What's the process look like for the average person? And what's the time frame on that? And then we'll talk about indications. Yeah. So the way that we approach uh, treatment with FMT is the first thing we always do is have a call with whoever is interested. And that breaks down like what it is, what the research says, what the person's looking for, um, and what kind of symptoms they have and if it would be a good fit. Um, so that's the beginning of the journey. Um, our journey kind of focuses like our standard protocol is focused on, on someone who has autism spectrum disorder. Of course, you know, in the call, if that's not what you're looking for, we kind of augment our, our process based on that. Um, but what we do is we have three checkpoints throughout the process with a physician's assistant. And that starts with looking at what medications you're taking, what your diet looks like, what symptoms you have, and creating a pre-treatment to prep your gut to be able to kind of yeah. Um, allow for this new gut to come in and, and, and get cozy in there. Um, and so they'll come to our treatment center after their pre-treatment and they spend a week there. And pre-treatment, um, would you ideally like a month or three months or what kind of pre-treatment timeframe? Pre-treatment, um, three to four weeks normally. Okay. Um, and that's normally based in like some kind of antibiotics. We know yeah. antibiotics just kind of wipe out the gut mm -hmm. microbiome. So we take advantage of something yeah. we know it's negative to kind of prep the gut so it's able to engraft yeah. new bacteria. Mm -hmm. um, and then they spend a week at one of our treatment centers and we have four right now. Um, we have one in Mexico, one in Hungary, uh, one in Australia and one in Panama. Wow. Um, and that allows basically to kind of reduce the stress mm -hmm. to getting to a treatment center. So we pair with uh, facilities that are able to do it, have like-minded physicians, and then we provide them with product and a protocol. Um, and then once they go home, we do uh, 15 weeks of treatment after that first initial week. And that's normally either um, oral capsules or for someone who can't swallow capsules, because we work with a lot of children, we have an oral powder that they can mm -hmm. just mix with juice and water. Um, and they do that for 15 weeks. And then over that period, they meet with the physician's assistant again to check in, um, as well as we do uh, different behavioral measurements and gastrointestinal measurements to kind of measure improvements to see what we're seeing change wise. Um, and then, you know, we kind of, we're, we're basically looking right now up to two years after yeah. uh, monitoring changes and seeing what kind of impacts we wow. see. I'm guessing, do you do stool testing? Of course, I'm assuming, is that part of it or not? We don't do no. stool okay. testing unless it's, it's uh, often parents will have a lot of that information. Yeah. We normally, we're working with kids with autism. So parents have a lot of information coming yeah. in. They've yes. kind of got a, a plethora <laughs> yeah. of yeah. kind of every health aspect. Uh -huh. um, but we do kind of everything individual. It depends okay. on where someone is in their yeah. health journey. Perfect. And so all of those things are, are dependent yeah. on that person. And that's why it always starts with a call because yeah. everybody kind of comes in at a different point. Um, and 
you know, if FMT is the correct treatment option, where they're starting is depend on where they'll end up. Okay. That makes perfect sense. So we know with, uh, at least in the United States, the FDA has approved this for C. diff colitis uh, because there's not a lot of other options. I think that's one of the reasons, again, you could speak to the research on that, but you and I know there's so many more likely applications. Um, What are you seeing the research trend to besides, I mean, what you're doing, obviously brand new research in this realm, because there's, and I think what happens is things that don't have a lot of other options, right? Those are the ones that are first allowed to be able to do this in an experimental way. Why don't you talk through like where we came from C. diff and what other indications are now being studied? Yeah. So in C. C. diff, um, it's it's mostly targeted people who don't respond to to typical treatment or have recurrent C. diff. So, you know, I've had multiple, you know, incidences. Um, And FMT treatment shows a 90% efficacy rate, which is huge. Mm -hmm. 90% just doesn't happen in a lot of things. Um, But on top of that, compared to what our standard treatment is, which is um, C. diff comes about most cases because of antibiotic treatment. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, the first line treatment for C. diff is antibiotic treatment. And heavy duty ones, because they have to do this for it. What they're actually seeing is that FMT seems to be more um, a more uh, efficacy mm-hmm. treatment option than what we're currently doing, which is antibiotics. Mm-hmm. Um, and because of the the safety profile on FMT right now, and as well as how you know efficient it seems to be with C diff, we're seeing a growth in, in outside of C diff where it could be used. Mm-hmm. And of course, all of this is is dependent on increased clinical research is needed, um, and just more clinical trials are needed to get a kind of better understanding. But um, for inflammatory bowel disease, mm-hmm. right now the studies are looking at kind of long term FMT treatments, which is normally loading doses similar to what we do in our protocol. So you have kind of a, a a couple of treatments, which are large doses and then short, um, periods with like, you know, lower dosed FMT mm-hmm. over long periods. Um, but for irritable bowel disease or IBD, um, it's about a 30%, uh, remission rate, which is fairly good. Mm-hmm. Um, and we're learning that in cases with something like IBD, where it has inflamed periods and non-inflamed periods, when treatment occurs and how, uh, and how high inflammation is seems to impact uh, the response. Um, irritable bowel disease shows about a 50% uh, remission rate, which is quite good. And that seems to be longer term. Um, there's not a lot of studies that have looked long-term. So the ones that have seem to show that the results seem to kind of go on for longer periods. Um, Parkinson's, Parkinson's disease and multiple sclerosis um, are very early to the gate. Both actually have a Parkinson's disease has three or four clinical trials going on right now. Um, and MS, I think has two, um, the preclinical research is really positive. And so, um, and the number of case studies there have been show, you know, both of these, these diseases show, you know, gastrointestinal issues. So we're seeing improvements there, but these secondary improvements in kind of the core, um, processes within this disease also seem to improve, um, for autism spectrum disorder, um, which of course is our focus. We see kids with ASD have more and more severe gastrointestinal issues than their pairs. On top of that, their gut seems to be more immature. So it doesn't match what their mm-hmm. aged pairs look like. And with, with doing FMT, we see improvements in these gastrointestinal uh, symptoms. Uh, one study showed a 77% improvement, wow. um, which lasted over two years. Mm. But on top of that, which we see in a lot of disorders, um, is autistic related behaviors also improve. Yeah. Um, and so the study that I'm talking about is from Dr. James Adams group out of Arizona state. Um, and they showed that initially they showed a 23% improvement in autistic related behaviors. And two years after when they looked, it was actually a 47% improvement. Yeah. So over time, as the gut kind of more changes, it integrates and you see, um, a whole shift to a more normal gut microbiome we're seeing changes in these behaviors. And we're seeing that in a lot of, um, neurological diseases, um, obesity and metabolic disorders is another area that's been kind of hotly looked at. Um, this research is kind of all over the place. Um, one of there's kind of two facets that have happened preclinically. And what we've seen in, in some studies is basically taking, you know, a lean, healthy, you know, non-obese gut microbiome and, putting it in someone, Mm -hmm. um, who is obese 
most of the changes there seem to be, you know, shift in the gut microbiome, which is good and how it's, you know, metabolizing things, but as well as for diabetes, uh, mm-hmm. insulin sensitivity seems to change. Um, but one of the areas that's been really interesting is uh, autologous fecal microbiota transplantation, which is actually using your yes. own gut microbiome and storing it and then using it later. Yeah. Um, and so what we see with um, metabolic disorders is it's, you know, when somebody is at their leanest, at their healthiest, they store their gut microbiome. And when that's, they use that to restore their gut later on, wow. um, we see, you know, improvements in insulin sensitivity. Um, and it seems to hold hold off weight gain. Not that it solves all things, but it does seem to shift um, how quickly that happens. Um, But of course that's really early days. Um, And the whole concept of banking your, your gut microbiome is, is growing in popularity. Um, And I think it is something that I think long-term will be something that more and more people are doing because, you know, at your healthiest, at your youngest, when your gut looks your best, storing that because you know, one time you take antibiotics and you get C. diff or, you know, you start to age and your gut deteriorates really quickly. Having that stored allows you to have this kind of health capsule ready. And as we learn more about what the gut can do, you know, how important will that be to have? Um, and I guess the last one I'll mention is, is in terms of cancers, what they're doing is, some of the treatments related to, to cancer treatment are, are quite invasive, um, especially when you're looking at stem cell treatments and what has to be done to the body for the body mm-hmm. to be able to, to, to handle a stem cell treatment. The interesting thing they're doing is they're doing fecal microbiota transplants after this period, after they do this treatment. And that's actually helping with graft versus host. Um, yeah. And it's also helping with some of those, the secondary symptoms. And so, you know, it's helping maintain health on top of these other, um, other treatments that are happening. So I think that's another interesting area that's being looked at is like, okay, so maybe it's not the gut microbiome that's playing the role in cancer, but we're doing all these other things and damaging the gut. If we restore that, can it kind of take some of these secondary symptoms away? Fascinating. I have so many questions as you're talking. First of all, I don't know if you know, but my history, I had 25 years at 25 years old during medical school, I had breast cancer, had three drug chemo. And then six months later, I got Crohn's disease and I had the genetics. And there's no doubt in my mind that some of the chemo drugs created more permeability. And had I known or or been able to, you know, do something like this, I probably would have staved off who knows, right. But it's interesting because it's very relevant to me personally, because and, and all my passion and work with the microbiome has been restoring the last 20 years, what happened with the chemo and the Crohn's. And I don't, I no longer have Crohn's because of what I've done, but I bet something like this could take that to the next level. Or had I known 20 years ago, this would have been so amazing because that's my theory is the cyclophosphamide. One of its mechanisms is creating intestinal permeability that it probably created more impermeable gut while I also had a gene NOD2 for Crohn's and then cross over into the immune system and triggered anyway, the, the rest of this is history, but so fascinating. So a couple of uh, questions. Um, uh, the donors, are you um, homogenizing the donors together or does each patient get a different donor? So we do, um, as an example, so you get two bottles yeah. of pills. Those will normally be two different donors. Okay. And then we tell patients actually to mix between the donors yep. during the day. So yep. it's not a mix within one pill, Got but it. it's, we do encourage them to, to use more than one donor. Okay. Um, and that's a, because we're still learning about yeah you know, what's important in each donor. Um, But we know that the donor microbiome plays a huge role in engraftment and those outcomes. And so by using multiple donors, you kind of increase, you know, the likelihood of success. Yeah. The likelihood, the variability and and what's going into the gut to kind of make a new gut microbiome. Fascinating. And are you testing for like keystones, like Akkermansia and Prisnitsky and Rosemary? Those are kind of the ones that really... Yeah. So the number of questions these donors get asked. So we look at uh, both their health history uh-huh. and their family health history and anything that could possibly be yeah. impacted by the gut microbiome. Um, and so that's, you know, everything from, you know, cancers, uh, obesity in your family, any kind of neurological condition. Um, if it is, if it is a disorder, it's most likely they will be negated. Yes. Um, we don't let any of our, all of our donors have never had antibiotics in their life. Wow. 
Um, How do you which is find really hard people? to find. I was going to say, I always joked years ago teaching about FMT before, you know, we've had options like what your clinic does. I would always say, now for me, I don't know where I'd find a good donor except for maybe Papua New Guinea. Like, <laughs> yeah, and, there, and it, it is hard to find. And I mean, in the published resources, you're looking about three, some of them go six months without yeah. antibiotics, but how long does it take the gut to go back to hundred percent? And what are the impacts yeah. of having to be restored? Right. So we kind of go the extreme and we know that without taking it, you're getting the healthiest gut. Yeah. All yeah. of our donors are vaginally born because wow. we know that that plays a role. Yes. Um, and as well, um, their diets, they report on their diets. So mm -hmm. they have to have a, you know, a wide variety. Um, we tell everybody, you know, try to eat 50 different foods a week mm -hmm. um, because what you eat but you eat feeds your gut. Yes. Yes. Um, and the variety in which you eat yes. is the variety in which your gut exists. And yes. so, um, as well as, and then they, they report on their physical activity, which are all things we know impact it. And the variety of questions we ask, the length of time wow. it takes to fill one of these out is really long, but as well, you know, standard 50 to 80% of people don't meet the requirements of the initial screening. Um, our screening is higher than that. Very few donors make it through. And then on top of that, their blood and stool is screened. Yeah. So even if you make it past the mm -hmm. initial health screening, then on top of that, your blood and stool is screened. So it's, you know, it's all the aspects we can control, we yeah. control for, and that's, you know, the, the donor can transfer things. So everything that could be transferred, we try yeah. to negate as much as possible. That's amazing. Cause that, I think it's so that's always been my thing with FMT. I'm like, this is amazing, but the donor is what makes a difference. And you guys are clearly doing your research and doing your work on that. Um, fascinating stuff. So where, uh, tell me about the clinic you work with and, uh, where, if people do want to get a hold of you guys, uh, how would they do that? And, uh, you said mainly autism. There's definitely a few other indications, but that's really where you focused. Yeah, so, yeah, sorry. Our focus is, is, is mostly kids with, with autism spectrum disorder as well as adults, but we do treat people with a variety other of other conditions. Anyone that reaches out with us, you know, we'll always work with them to see if it is a good fit. Um, so because our process starts with a call, that's all booked on our website. There's no cost. There's no, you know, you're not guaranteeing anything. Mm -hmm. um, it's mostly just because we want everyone to be informed and we want to be transparent about, you know, what we do know, what it can do and what it can't do. Um, and so, you know, you can go to our website, which is uh, www.novelbiome.com. Um, and you can go there and then book a call with us. Look, our website kind of ranges everything from the history of where fecal microbiota transplants happened, which is about 1700 years ago, wow. um, to, you know, our blog, which walks you through like, how is it done? Um, you know, why are, you know, why do, why do some people use frozen stool? One people, some mm -hmm. people use fresh. So everything that we can think that has been a yeah. question, we try to provide information on. Um, but as well, then you can book a call and talk with someone on our team and ask all of the questions you have. And we'll have questions for you to try to make, you know, the best pairing. And, and if we're not the right pairing, try to, you know, guide you to, to where the best next option is. Oh my gosh. Amazing that you're doing this. I love it. And I love hearing more. Um, and then one thing you mentioned that I think is realistic expectations is this doesn't like overnight change necessarily, right? It can be even months or years where you really see the maximum benefit. And that makes perfect sense to me. But what would you say is like, when you really start to notice changes, what's a kind of a time frame when patients might expect if they did this? Yeah. So uh, in terms of C. diff and, and even what we see, gastrointestinal symptoms can improve quite quickly. Mm -hmm. um, we've had patients that have been treated for C. diff and they said within 24 to 48 hours, they saw huge improvements. Wow. Um, and because it is, it, it is, you know, the loading doses are, are quite high and it really is, especially in terms of C. diff, mm -hmm. um, it's kind of battling back the yes. bacteria that's negative and giving it, you know, allowing the host to build new bacteria. Um, on average, we see improvements, gastrointestinal, somewhere around five weeks, we see huge mm -hmm. GI improvements. And then within eight weeks, we start to see behavioral changes. Wow. Um, and so it is a longer term course. And what we're finding with FMT, as you kind of indicated, over time, you can s continue to see changes. And so far, you know, two years seems to be the longest anyone has looked. Um, but the improvements are continuous. When we talk to parents, they say the same thing yeah. is that, you know, there's the first improvements and then those continuously kind of guide where things are going to go. Um, and because of this, you know, diet changes 
that also has yes. other impacts as well. Um, and then just general quality of life improvements for both families and for the children themselves also have impacts. So, you know, it's, it's a holistic kind of change yes. where the gut microbiome plays a big role and that causes changes, but as well, because of those other changes happen. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's, it's that holistic, it's, like you're treating the whole, and you, yeah. I assume you give them the, here's the ideal diet you should be eating to make it work. Right. Cause that's part yeah. of, okay. We've heard kind of provide support throughout okay. and, you know, answer questions of like, mm -hmm. what is the best food, yeah. and, you know, uh, what kind of new changes, what yeah. kind of, you know, these things have changed. So what kind of foods should we do next yeah. or what kind of, you do you know, find that the FMT changes their cravings too? Like, do they change their, what they want to eat? Cause that often I can see. With yeah. It, we see augmentation in kind of their food aversions. Yes. Um, so with, with kids with ASC, that's a big one. Um, as well as, you know, we try to be realistic, which is like in the first couple of weeks, like here's, here are ways to start integrating more foods. And as more foods get integrated and the gut is being fed, we see that they're, you know, we see how they take on new foods becomes a more positive experience. So, um, you know, we've been working with a lot of parents and, and we kind of try to, we try to learn from them as well, yeah. because, um, if you've ever met a child, a parent or a family that has a child with autism, they are so well-informed. They're yes. more well-informed than yes. I am most days. Um, and they're very willing to kind of discuss what works and what doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And so in working with them, we're kind of always kind of trying to tweak what the information we provide is as well, because it's a huge life change. It's yeah. a huge family change. Yes. So it's, you know, what are the best ways to tackle that and, and, best feed this yeah. new gut microbiome and also support because life happens, kid gets yes. sick. So how do we, you know, also work with them when those kind of mm. struggles happen? I love that. And I'm assuming like, um, maybe not a celiac kind of patient situation, but some of the other food uh, intolerances, I'm assuming that could change as well, right? Because all of a sudden you restore, do you see that where patients get less um, reactive to certain foods? Um, I wouldn't know if hang because it really is dependent. Like we have some people sure. come with us that have no restrictive yeah. diets, you know, and then others that, you know, there's no Got gluten, it. there's no dairy, yeah. there's yeah. no corn, there's no, right. Um, mm -hmm. So it really depends. And, okay. and it also is where they are in the journey. I find people that, um, diet tends to be one of the first things we change. Yeah. And when you think about having a dysfunctional gut, that's not able to process or work the way it's supposed to foods that are hard on the gut to yeah. process are the first ones we take out. Um, but we know that as the gut kind of changes, their diets can change, yeah. but you know, it doesn't mean all their allergies or intolerances mm -hmm. will go away. And that will depend on why the food was removed as well. Got it. Um, amazing, amazing information, such a great resource. I knew I'd enjoy this, but it was so good. Um, one last thing I'm sure people are wondering, obviously this kind of thing right now is not FDA approved as is. So this is part of what we need to do to advance research, but what kind of cost would people expect for the full treatment for a patient? Yeah. So for our, um, for our like ASD protocol, which is, you know, 16 weeks plus one week, yeah. um, as well as meeting, we have some some measurements that are done, not done by parents, done by a clinician, as well as meeting with a physician's assistant. So it's a quite extensive package, which is specific for people with, with a child or themselves with ASD. So the cost is associated with what someone's coming yes. with us for, but, um, our ASD protocol is, uh, just for $14,000. Um, and so that includes everything and then support afterwards as yeah. well. And again, that makes sense. This is incredibly intensive. And, and I'm assuming as a physician, I could refer to you or have patients contact you or any docs that, because we have a lot of docs who listen too. So if they're listening to do functional medicine and they want, so ASD is your primary thing right now, yes. hopefully this will expand. Um, I'm going to help you get the word out because I think it's a great resource. Um, any last final takeaways? If someone's like listening, maybe they have a child who has autism and they tried a lot of things, any last little pearls for us before I let yeah. you go? I think looking at where the research is going and the support for how impactful gut change is, um, I think in disorders that we think that gut plays a huge role in, in gut and behavior seem to go together. When we talk to parents, they can say when gut symptoms are high, behavior is high. Yes, yes. Um, or they'll call, and, and this isn't just specific to ASD because I, I have friends like this. They call themselves like gut people, like yeah. my gut determines everything in my life. Yeah. Well, what if you could teach your gut to 
allow you to have more freedom or less severe behavioral swings or, you know, better moods. That's what FMT is, is allowing is allowing your gut the chance to learn how to be more normal or, um, more functional yeah, and then allowing you to then, you know, augment things going forward because your gut is able to do and communicate the way it's supposed to. And I, you can't undersell the importance of your gut because if you just take the simple idea of you have a bad day, you eat bad food, you feel bad, which causes you to have a bad day, which causes you to eat bad right. food. Well, that's all connected because you have a bad day, stress is up um, and your mood is down. Well, you crave food that is yes. not going to feed the gut the way it needs to, which then kind of perpetuates this kind of momentum going forward. So we know, you know, you are what you eat mm -hmm. is becoming a more true statement than we ever thought. Um, and I think understanding gut health and how that could play a role in, in your everyday life, I think is, is invaluable. Mm. Couldn't agree more. Um, Shana, thank you so much for your time and your expertise. It's super valuable. I know a lot of people have gotten help and have already had some comments. Um, so thanks again for your time today. No problem. And uh, if you want to learn more, we have a, a YouTube channel where, you know, every week I try to cover some topic that I find of interest, um, but that kind of brings in, you know, more about FMT or more about the gut. Um, and we're always willing for people to give us topics they'd like to hear about as well, um, because this body of research, as you said, is growing every day. And so we're trying to, you know, summarize it because I find it a lot. I can't imagine somebody else trying to do it when it's I not totally, their yeah, you job. need it. Exactly. There's so much there. So thanks again. Thanks for distilling it for us. And then be sure and send me a link to your YouTube channel. I will include that wherever you're listening to this live as well. Perfect. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you so much, Dana.